Rejoice, rejoice, for God with us is coming. Well, good morning. Um, I've got a couple of scriptures for you this morning on this idea of hope. Now, you may have noticed a little bit of um, publicity around about the 2021 census. What was the headline about, about the church? We're a minority. 46% of people in the 2021 uh, syllabus, no, uh, census, ticked the box that said they were Christian. Um, it's not that loads of people are moving from being saying that they're Christian to other religions. The largest rise was in the nuns. Um, I don't mean those who wear habits, but the N O N E S which is those who don't claim to have any religion at all. That was increased to 37%. Um, and there was a lot of angst going on on social media, certainly, and certainly hit the papers, you know, that uh, it's the first time that percentage has fallen below 50%. Um, now, in the, in the second service, I was talking about our cards for this season, love, light, hope. And hope is the biggest words there, because we are hope bearers. And I just want to encourage us all that actually we shouldn't worry too much about these statistics for a range of reasons, which I won't necessarily go into, but just to look at scripture. Um, and the two scriptures I'm going to look at, if you've, you should have Bibles in front of you if you want to look up these particular passages. The ones we're going to look at briefly are Judges 7, and then 2 Corinthians 12. Judges 7 and 2 Corinthians 12. Um, now, Gideon is famous for two things, probably. Um, the first one is the fact that he kept testing God by putting his fleece out. Um, we're not going to look at that one. That was Judges 6. But having finally convinced himself that he was called by God, he then went off to fight the Midianites. <clears throat> um, and this is where we pick it up in Judges 7. And 7 verse 2, uh, sorry, verse 1, we're told that um, Gideon and all his men camped to the spring of Harod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the, in the valley near the hill of Moray. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands or Israel would boast against me. So if the accumulated armies of Israel were to win, then they go, what a wonderful army we've got. And God has a different plan. So he says, you've got too many men. So in verse 3, now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. Well, there were 30,000 of them, and two-thirds of them, 20,000, run away. So that sorted the first lot. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men, in verse 4. Take them down to the water, and I will thin them out for you. If I say one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he will not go. So Midian took the men, sorry, Gideon took the men down to the water, and there the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. 300 of them drank from cut hands, it says in verse 6, lapping like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink, which sounds a bit more normal. Um, the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped I will save you. He started with 30,000, and the Lord has thinned them down to 300. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the 300 who took over the provisions. Now the camp of the valley lay below, uh, so the camp of Midian lay below in the valley, and during the night the Lord said to Gideon, Get up, go down against the camp. Listen to what they are saying, in verse 11. Afterward, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So he and his servant Pura went down to the outpost of the camp. The Midianites, the Malachites, 
And all the other eastern peoples had settled in the valley thick as locusts. Their camels could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. So there's 300 of them and loads and loads of the others. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend his dream. I had a dream, he was saying. Now, remember what we were saying about the, uh, the word for today, about a light and a tree and then going into a spaceship? And you might be going, well, that's a bit weird. Just listen to this. I had a dream. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. That is some hovis, isn't it, really? <laughs> Sadly, I have dreams like this. I don't know about you. I have weird, weird dreams. Anyway, his friend responded, this could be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash. Now, what happens is that they go down, the 300 of them, they, sit, they encircle the camp and the Midianites, and they blow their trumpets, and all of the Midianites then turn on one another, and then the rest of them run away. A miraculous win. 46% of people say that they are Christians, when 20 years ago it was probably 61%. The numbers are falling. Are we worried? Do we see this as a battle to go into? Being whittled down in number of those who would say, I'm a Christian, whether, you know, how sincere they might be in ticking that box, shouldn't really worry us. Because our call is not to be and this number or that number, our call is to be faithful. So, could we turn to 2 Corinthians 12? And basically, stuff happens. Unexpected stuff happens, and it can feel like doors are closing or things are, you know, getting bad or whatever. And I just want to look at some of the words of Paul. I mean, how must Gideon have felt when the first 20,000 ran away, let alone when it was whittled down to 300? So 2 Corinthians 12, I must go on boasting. It goes on in verse 5. I will boast about a man like that because he just describes his, his coming to faith in Jesus by meeting him on the road, in sort of hyper-spiritual terms, really. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of these surpassingly great revelations." Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, can you see the resonance there with what was going on with Gideon? If they win with 30,000, then they'll claim it as their own victory. If they do it with 300, they'll say it was the Lord. And so Paul is saying, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh. We're never told what it is. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardship, in persecutions, in difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. And we've said many times working through these letters of Timothy in recent weeks that Timothy has been charged with preaching and teaching and holding to and guarding the deposit of the truth. And we are called to preach and to teach and to live and to love in the truth. And others are not necessarily going to like that. And we might feel weak in that position. But it is in that weakness 
that we are strong. And when the Spirit and the Word meet, the word we've had is that there will be an explosion of power. And that power will be seen by those who scoffed. And some will be drawn to find out more about that power. So we must not hold on to idols. And that might be the establishment of the church. That might be the church structures as we have them. There's a, a, a movement within the church to plant in the next 10 years 10,000 new worshipping communities, even if that's a house church of five people. And there's another part of the church which has set up an organisation called Save the Parish. Well, if that is just for the sake of continuing that which has always been, and that's an idol, then don't save the parish. I like the parish. I think it's a great idea. I think it's a wonderful invention. But if the only reason we want to hold on to it is because we've always had it, then let it die. And let something new and fresh and vibrant and filled with the Spirit and the Word grow. I'm not wishing the end of the Church of England. Don't, don't hear me wrong. But we need to hold lightly onto that which is so that that which will come will be fruitful. Now that's talking about the church. This might speak to you in your current situation or somebody that you know or somebody that you love. So let's just spend some time just inviting God into that idea. It's when we strive to be strong that we squeeze God out of the equation. And sometimes we need to embrace our weakness and to say, Lord, I don't have much, but what I've got is yours. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Your people are here waiting to be filled. Let's lay aside all the things that we strive to make us strong and invite him in, in our weakness. For his power is stronger than any strength that we can muster. Come, Holy Spirit, in healing. Come, Holy Spirit, in encouragement. Here again, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may, be, may rest on me. Come, Lord Jesus. Can I invite the band forward? leaders in this continuing time of ministry if anybody has a word or a picture or a scripture or something that they think might be from the Lord to build up the church to let me know
I think there's a real sense that it's very difficult to admit our weaknesses, even though we know that it will let more of the Lord in because we have to admit them to ourselves. But he is a healer, he is an encourager. He builds us up. Now, Lisa and I will be at the back if you would like somebody to pray with you or just to discern anything that you might be hearing. And they don't come much weaker than us too.